welcome to Dirt, Sweat, and Gears, where we don't stop, and that's actually kind of a problem when we're parked on a hill. We're here with the Miata, and we're going to take care of a real nuisance and actually kind of a safety concern. Uh, as you can see, when I was parked on the hill and I tried to get out of the car, it started to roll away. And that is because, for some reason, the handbrake doesn't work. I can only imagine why. I wonder if maybe the previous owner might have uh, tried to do a little bit of drifting. Um, yeah, no, that couldn't be it. No, 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 no. He 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 only drove it to church and back. That that's that that's that's crazy talk. I actually don't know what this problem is. I suspect it's related to the cable. Maybe if it was uh, pulled a few too many times uh, while the car was in motion, it might have stretched out. I thought it was because the rear brakes were toast, but uh, the rear brakes are fine. Uh, because they're brand new. I put them on when I was redoing this whole car and I actually replaced uh, three of the four calipers. So I know it's not the brakes themselves. It has to be related to the cabling. Uh, hopefully, I mean, if I'm really lucky, all I have to do is make an adjustment, you know, uh, tighten some nut here or something like that. But uh, worst case scenario, I do have new cables that go to the calipers from the handbrake. So if we run into that problem, uh, we'll take care of it when we get there. But first, we have to find out what's going on here. So I could start throwing new parts at it without actually testing what's going on. But considering I am currently giving someone a hard time for suggesting that on the 3rd Gen Prelude Facebook group, I'm going to practice what I preach and start doing some proper tests. So uh, the car is on jack stands. I've already tested to make sure it's not going to fall on me. Uh, and that is to, you know, push on all four corners before you get under it and uh, make sure you're comfortable before you get under it. So I've already done that and we're under the car. Uh, the handbrake is on. The car is not in gear. So uh, we're going to go ahead and push on this wheel here. And you see I'm trying to move it and it doesn't move. So this is at least holding uh, the force of my hand, which is, you know, not very much, but it's something. Over here on the passenger side rear wheel, however, it's spinning freely. So it's logical to deduce that the reason that the car may be rolling back on a hill could be because there's only one wheel holding it in place. And how effectively is that one wheel holding it? Well, we don't know that just yet, but let's get this uh, not spinning freely when the handbrake is on before we cross that bridge. I've done some research and there's actually two issues here at play. The first issue is gonna be in here with the handbrake. So the handbrake, you're supposed to only have some, uh, between six and nine clicks or seven and nine clicks, maximum nine. And we are at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, seventeen clicks. So we have to adjust that. Uh, this is really easy to adjust. I just have to take off this cover here and then there's a like a screw head bolt thing right over here on the other side of this cover here and I just have to adjust that that's the first thing we have to do now, there is another issue that very well could be in play here and that is I replaced this caliper I th may have replaced both but I know I replaced this one because this one was seized to uh, the brake rudder there is apparently an adjustment screw on the back of the caliper where you can adjust the clamping force when the brake is on. So we're going to take a look at that, but first we got to look at the handbrake. All right, so I got that little thing in and you see that there is a slot for a flathead screwdriver. And I'm going to go ahead and give this, oh, I don't like how that moved. Well, five more clicks. Eight. Nine is the maximum. This is good. This is good. So I'm going to put this cover back on and let's take a look at what happens with the wheels. All right, the handbrake is up. Nine clicks. And this wheel doesn't move. That's not news. Let's go take a look at the one that moved before. 
Does this move? Yes, it does. Okay, so um, we have the handbrake adjusted to where it needs to be. Now let's see if we can balance the load between the uh, two rear wheels and hopefully solve this problem without spending any money and, and throwing parts at it. So the first thing we see here is I uh, may end up adjusting the cable, but we need to take a look at the other side of this cable. So let's take a, so let's go up there. Uh, the cable is actually behind the drive shaft over here. And we can see, what can we see? Well, you can't see, well, actually, you may be able to see better than I can. Let's see if we can get an angle. There we go. All right, so the cable is pulled, the handbrake is pulled, and we're actually getting pretty even distribution between the two sides here. So I don't think the problem is in the cabling. I think the problem may be in the caliper. Because like I said, this is a new caliper, which means it's never been adjusted. So there's uh, three uh, nuts here. The fir first one, if you follow the brake hose, uh, leads to a cable for the banjo bolt and all of that goodness. Uh, there's two others that are adjacent to it. There's one that says 10.9. Uh, that is for the uh, e-brake cable bracket. Okay, we don't want to touch that. We want to touch this other one. Uh, this other one, this old dusty one that has no markings up on it. We're going to pull that out, and there is an Allen adjustment inside of it. Okay, I've got it off. Uh, got <laughs> phrasing. Uh, I, I've removed the bolt, and you see inside there, there is a Allen inside of it. Uh, this was a 14 millimeter. It was a bolt with a uh, copper crush washer. I don't think you need to replace the crush washer. Uh, th this is just to protect the adjustment nut. So I'm gonna get a Allen in there. I'll tell you what size it is once I find out. The process here is first you need to release the handbrake. So uh, the handbrake is released. I just went and did that. And then you have to tighten this Allen nut down all the way until it seats. Uh, so it's, you know, once you tighten it all the way, it's snug, and then you back it off by about a third. All right, well, I used a four mil Allen, and uh, yeah, it, I had to turn it like three or four times for it to snug. So I snugged it, and then I backed it off by about a third, and uh, let's see uh, what happens when we pull the handbrake. Ow! No! Pull the handbrake. Check the, yep, that's not turning. And that's not turning. This is promising news. Let's put that cat back on. We'll put the car on the ground and see if it rolls backward on the hill. All right, the car is in neutral. Brake is on. We're gonna start it up. And then we're gonna give it a little roll back before we get on the hill. Oh yeah, that stopped really nice. Let's uh, get on the hill proper. Half the car out of the garage will do. We're holding. Wow. So this is awesome. If the car is actually rolling at any amount of speed, like five miles or more, I yank on the handbrake, I can actually lock the rear wheels, which is, I mean, if I wanted to be an idiot, I could, but that's just kinda, I don't, I'm an idiot in other ways. I don't like to drive like an idiot. So uh, that's probably a feature I will never use, but more importantly, I can stop the car on this hill and I don't need to have the transmission in gear every single time, which means I can do things like run the car and not be in it. I can really rely on the handbrake to stop the car when I need to. Now, when I'm parking, I'm still gonna put it in gear because that's just good standard practice, but knowing that I can rely on the handbrake to stop the car is really, really good. Good for peace of mind, makes the car a lot safer. So now that we've made the car safer and more functional, we gotta make it more fun. So I'm gonna order the pins that I'm missing to rewire that stereo, and then we're gonna check back in when I'm ready to do that. Well, I was going to install the stereo, but the Miata had other plans in store. So last night I was up in Santa Clarita with my wife. We were driving around, it was about 100 degrees. And so, of course, we were blasting the air conditioning, and suddenly it stopped working. 
And so we drove home uh, after watching Star Trek, of course. Uh, we drove home late at night. It was nice and cool. And uh, today I hooked up the manifold gauges and we have no pressure. So I know exactly what caused this. It's not gonna show up on camera, so you're just gonna have to take my word for it. But I took a UV light and I started shining it all around all of the connections uh, because it was dark and I was taking advantage of the low light scenario. So uh, I had a UV light and shining it, you know, on all of the connections, on all the service ports. And finally I get to the compressor and the compressor is completely covered in UV dye. So the remanufactured compressor from RYC, r and y Compressors, uh, died after three months. So I guess the good news from this is that it's not my fault. It was just a garbage remanufacturer. But don't ever buy a compressor from RYC. And I bought it on Amazon. And because I bought it almost a year ago, I installed it about six months ago and I charged it three months ago they're of course not going to honor any kind of warranty so I have to buy another one I get to spend another 500 bucks I found a supplier that uh, is sort of local or local enough to have it to me quickly so I guess I'm gonna wait for that until the end of the week and my wife gets to drive a car with no air conditioning in the meantime She's gonna leave me. Wait, what's going on here? Is that, is that a wood screw? Oh my God, it's a wood screw. Ah, oh, God damn it. So I got the Miata up on jack stands. I have the new compressor here already. So this compressor, I bought it on eBay, but it, it was done by a local rebuilder, someone local to me. Uh, they're about, I don't know, half hour's drive away. So if I have any problems with this, I actually know where to go and I can put this on their bench and say, you screwed me. So unlike the one that's in the car that I bought on Amazon, uh, this time, the day that I get this thing in, which will hopefully be today, is also going to be the day that I charge it. And uh, the life of this thing will, uh, if it dies after three months, it'll still be in warranty. And uh, either way, I'm going to take it back to the shop that rebuilt it and tell them that they screwed me. So uh, this is ready to go, but before we can put that in, we have to take the other one out. Well, long story short, this project ended up being a lot bigger than I anticipated because I had to remove the radiator fans in order to remove the power steering pump in order to get access to the compressor. So I wanted to show you the UV dye that's covered all over the compressor however the power steering fluid washed most of it off but i believe there's enough remnants here uh, that you can see what was going on yeah you see it back here right there uh, it's completely coated back there this was all covered in green before uh, it's much less dramatic now because the power steering fluid that came out of the pump just kind of drenched this whole thing and uh, washed a lot of it away but yeah it's definitely happening from the compressor uh, more on the low side than on the high side, but um, uh, there it is, all over the side of it there. Yeah. All right, so to remove this, first you got to make sure the system is empty. And, uh, well, R and Y already did that by making a shitty compressor. So, um, you know, EPA should go after them for venting all of that crap in the atmosphere, not me, uh, because the compressor did that. So you need to pull the lines here. There's a bolt down here on the bottom. Kind of got to be underneath the car to get to it. And then there's four bolts here. One, two, three, four. There's this electrical connection that goes up to uh, this connector up here that I uh, just kind of rip right out because um, the new compressor comes with that wiring already. Uh, over here is the new compressor. Uh, again, like I said, it has that connection and all of the electrical stuff already on it, which is really, really good because I don't have to worry about any of this crap. I can just take it all out with the compressor and leave it out. As you can see, my day got even more interesting. 
So I had to pull the bumper away. I didn't have to take it completely off, uh, but I needed to get better access to the dryer. And uh, supposedly you're supposed to be able to work within this hole here, but this just wasn't enough. Uh, I needed to get down under here so I could reach my hand under, and pulling the bumper cover was uh, really just the best option. Um, it means that there's a whole bunch of hardware on the floor that I'm going to lose, but you know what? That's a problem for future me. I'm not going to worry about that just yet. So. I have replaced the dryer and I have replaced the compressor and there's new O-rings uh, and uh, well there's new O-rings except for this one. This one uh, the I did not have uh, the size of O-ring that this needed but the O-ring that was on here was healthy it wasn't squished so I feel comfortable reusing it. And also because of that and because I touch the system and open it up and all that stuff before we go any further with this project I'm gonna pull vacuum and make sure that it holds a vacuum over time so I was pulling vacuum and uh, sure enough it was actually not holding pressure on the low side uh, it would go straight back up to zero every time I either close this or I turned off uh, the uh, compressor the pump so I hooked up my compressor to the manifold and I decided uh, to just pressurize the line with uh, air. And uh, I know that means I'm gonna have to do a deep vacuum after this. I, I knew that already. I was already prepared to do that. Uh, but uh, more importantly, I wanted to figure out what this problem was. So I'm hearing the hissing down at the dryer and when I spray it with the soapy water, you see it bubbling up right here. That just means that Hopefully all I need to do is tighten this. I did change the dryer, so this is something that I just touched. And uh, let's get the wrench in there and see if it needs further to go. Just visually looking at it, it looks like it does. So, oh yeah, this is still fairly easy to turn. So let's get this thing tightened up and hopefully, hopefully solve this problem. This side has a brand new seal on it as well. Oh, I can hear it going away. Oh, this is, oh, I'm so happy. That is, that is good. That is good. So I'm just going to keep turning this until uh, it stops turning easily, until it feels snug. And then I'm going to see if the manifold holds pressure. And if it does, then uh, I'm going to go do a deep vacuum and uh, pull out all of the moisture that I just introduced to it. So last night while this thing was pulling vacuum, I got kind of into a flow and I got quite a bit done. Uh, we're going to start over here on this side. I got the power steering pump on. Uh, of course, it's not tensioned because uh, there's no belt on there, but I really wanted to get all of the lines reconnected so that it would stop leaking all over my floor. Uh, that was uh, really, really annoying. Uh, my gloves that I had zip tied onto all of the lines just kind of filled up like, a, well, um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that up to your imagination. They filled up with fluid. Uh, over here, I uh, have replaced the idle air control valve. And that is because I had the part sitting on the shelf for about two months. I have really wanted to replace that because the idle was behaving kind of, kind of weird. And I'm not sure if it was a mechanical issue or an electrical issue, uh, but I spent the money, so I figured I'd put it on there. That part is worth more than the entire car. It costs 600 bucks. You see here, I'm missing the little plastic cover uh, for that electronic component. Fell off and it is somewhere in the car or under the car. I just have to find it and glue it back on. Not really a problem. On the throttle body gaskets, I used a little bit of RTV on this back one because of the bottom bolts. I was a little concerned uh, with their ability or inability to grab onto the metal or lack of metal of the intake manifold. So I put RTV on that one. I decided I'm just gonna sacrifice this and uh, you know replace it if I ever have to pull it off again. Uh, the radiator hoses are all reconnected too so I don't leak coolant all over the place. And lastly, I've also reconnected the radiator fans because I wanted to get that in there before I forget about it and then end up doing something really stupid and have to take it all apart again. So now let's uh, have our moment of truth and open up the service port side of our AC manifold. All right, so I have the camera zoomed in on the manifold because we need to see if the gauges move when I open up the service ports.
I think we're in good shape. I think we're in good shape. I'm going to go ahead and open up the high pressure side as well, just to be sure. I'm fairly certain the high pressure side is fine though. closed. There we go. That's open. All right. Well, look at that. We're holding vacuum. This is amazing. This is really amazing. I'm holding vacuum, which means uh, this project was a success. I can recharge it. Now, there's still a whole lot left to do, so uh, I have to get to it. I have to fill up the coolant, fill up the power steering fluid, uh, reconnect the air box. I have to put the power steering and AC belt on and uh, put the bumper back on. Uh, all of the hardware is off of it. I'd hate to forget that. And then put the intake charge tube on so that I can start the car up and run it. And I, I'm really on the home stretch. This is so exciting. I'm so glad that I was able to do this. I'm so glad I was able to solve this problem, fix it, and hopefully get the car back on the road next day. This, is, this, this car is so great. Oh, look at this. We're all back together. Well, except for the bumper. The bumper will fall off if I try to drive it like that. But uh, mechanically, engine-wise, we're all back together. So before I charge the AC, I want to bleed the coolant and to bleed the power steering fluid. Uh, that's because this is going to get hot, and those service ports are really uh, in a terrible place with this coolant reroute because it's all going to be really hot, and I'm going to have to touch all that stuff. You know, even getting to the high side, I have to touch the radiator, which is going to be a million degrees once this car warms up. So I've raised the idle a little bit, but it still runs terribly. So I'm going to spray some car clean around here and see what happens. I got a vacuum leak right there. I don't want to take that off. 